One of the prickly paradigms that we face as quail managers and landowners in West Texas is what to do about prickly pear and quail. Now, if you're just in the livestock business, you'd like to get rid of most of your prickly pear. But if you're wearing your quail cap and you're saying, well, what functions does, does prickly pear have for quail? It makes you rethink some things. So what I want to do is talk to you about the, the pros and the cons of prickly pear for quail management and then tell you about some of the ways that we've tried to minimize the negatives and accentuate the positives here at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. Just how big of a problem the cactus is or whether or not it's an asset to a quail manager basically depends on the density. I'm in an area right now where there are six to 10 pads per square foot. That's too much for me to want to be in. And it's too much for my bird dog to want to be in. So we've got to be able to take some of our control techniques and narrow that down, uh, control maybe 80% of it. But first, let me talk about some of the pros of having prickly pear. Number one, in this type of prickly pear, this low pear, what we call sand pear, it's, prov it's providing valuable nesting cover. Even here on the research ranch where we have a lot of grass, quail still select prickly pear 30 to 70% of the time. And what we found through our research is that quail that nest in prickly pear, those nests survive at about twice the rate of those that nest in grass. So it provides some mechanical protection. It's not rocket science. It keeps some of your nest predators at bay. So from that standpoint, quail benefit from that prickly pear. Aside from the cover standpoint, it also provides food. And there's really two ways to think about this. If you see quail, if you see a Bob White about uh, August or September, a lot of times, he'll have a purple face. It's almost like he's been sprayed for pink eye if you're in the cattle business. Has that purple flesh from those tunas, those ripe tunas. They're eating those seeds, they're eating the flesh of those tunas. It, it benefits quail another way in that it serves as a buffer food species for one of the quail's enemies, that being coyotes. We did a three year study of coyote diets out here and the number two food item across all three years of that study was prickly pear. So it serves as a buffer species. And by doing that, it allows coyotes to eat something besides quail. So it probably takes a little bit of the pressure off of them like that. So it benefits quail in several ways. From the standpoint of nesting cover, if we're talking bunch of grasses, we want them to be a minimum the size of a basketball, something like this. If we're talking prickly pear, we want it to be the size of a hula hoop. So that type of dimensions. And you can look at the webisode we did called Dummy Nest Quail CSI. It'll show you a technique for how to measure those and how to relate those to your nesting success. If you decide to control your prickly pear because it's just too doggone thick, you got several options. First of all, you can burn it. Fire prescribed burning, especially say during February and March is a fairly common practice across much of West Texas but you're not gonna kill very much prickly pear with a spring burn, 20% perhaps. I'm standing in an area that we burned in August of 2010. It was 100 degrees, it was 22% relative humidity, it was a hot fire. We got about 98% control on the prickly pear out here, but that's a very drastic kind of a fire. I don't recommend it to everybody. And from the quail manager standpoint, it was just too hard on our woody cover. When I kill a loke bush that's this tall and I take it back to ground level, it's gonna take it 20 years to grow back. So those are some of the things I gotta think about as a quail manager trying to control my prickly pear. If I do a cooler fire, say in February, March, and then I follow that with an application of an herbicide and you have two options, one is surmount, the other one is Tordon 22K, we can take out 90 to 95% of the prickly pear there. It's gonna cost us a little bit more this past year, 2014, we sprayed 1,400 acres, most of it with Tordon 22K, some with Surmount, but we're interested in knowing what is the collateral damage. Not only did we kill the prickly pear, what is the damage to our forbs? How long is our western ragweed gonna be reduced? Those are some of the kind of things, the answers that we wanna know so we can help you as land managers fully understand what the implications of that treatment are. We know we're gonna have some collateral damage to some of our good woody plants. We're gonna kill the hackberries. If we use Tordon, we're killing the hackberries. So again, those are some of the pros and cons that we have to weigh into this equation about whether or not we're gonna control prickly pear, and if so, where. If we're gonna do it, map out your thickest country, 
use GPS mapping, communicate that. We apply ours with a helicopter so we can do surgical strikes. We want to do that so we can accentuate the positive and minimize the negatives. By far the majority of the prickly pear that we have here at the Rolling Plains Quill Research Ranch is this kind of pear. Less than boot top high, one or two pads high. It's called brown spine prickly pear. It's, an, it's a pain, literally, if you're a quail hunter or a bird dog. And when you get grass over that, it really becomes a pain for bird dogs because they can't see it. So this is what we're typically targeting for control by the various techniques that we talk about. Right here, though, we have another kind of pair that if you can, you don't want to control this one. This is generically what we call South Texas prickly pear. It's a much taller pear. It can grow a head high and it serves some special purposes for quail. Now you see it's just full of fruit right now and again those quail and coyotes and deer will be eating those tunas and the seeds inside them. But a quail pursued by a hawk, a cooper's hawk, odds are is gonna find a refuge in here. And we did an experiment several years ago and it's amazing to see what we call escape cover and what a quail calls escape cover and they have a much more rigid standard. So when pursued by a hawk, they would hit something like this 38% of the time they find a burrow and they go underground to get away from that. So protect these. These are good midday coverts, good escape cover. Don't intentionally kill these if you can keep from it. One special application of prickly pear control is something we tried here several years ago called patch burn grazing. We burned small patches out of a larger pasture. About 10% of the total pasture was burned. We put cows in there. Those cows will eat that freshly burned prickly pear. And it worked pretty darn well. The, uh, the, they'd eat the big, the only thing that was regretful was they ate the big pear before they ate the little pear that we were trying to protect. But you've got an area right here that's ungrazed. This one gets heavily grazed. Some of the cactus gets eaten. This grows up in sunflowers next year. We burn another one, shifts the grazing over there. So that, that's another technique you may want to consider, patch burn grazing.